Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Wooly Wednesday that we're doing because we just couldn't fit all of our favorite breeds into one month. Like we're just too excited and there's just too many awesome, awesome sheep to talk about. So we're doing an extra one today with some awesome guests. Uh, with me today is Sindra Kirscher, our Shave em to Save em, uh coordinator with the Livestock Conservancy and Will Houston. Thanks for joining us today. We're so excited you're here. Happy and to be here. All right. Hey, um, everybody. Thanks for watching. Absolutely. And I'm Becky Sweeney, the communications manager with the Livestock Conservancy. Um, Will, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us about your awesome sheep? Sure. My name's Will Houston. Uh, my wife and I, my wife's name is Pam Hand. I didn't change my name after we got married. And the two of us are retired veterinarians, and we live on a small farm in Virginia in the shadow of the Blue Ridge Mountains called mm. Springwood Farm. Sounds lovely. <laughs> and so you're raising Barbados black belly sheep. Barbados black belly sheep. And that's really become our passion as it was uh, at this point in our lives. And, and we love to talk about them and help others who are interested in this breed. That's awesome. And exactly why you are joining us today, yes? I think we have a photo of you and Pam, don't we? To share? I think you have a photo. There we are. Oh. That's soon after we move down. You can get the idea that as veterinarians, we really like animals. <laughs> and so we still have the horse. Uh, we now have, well, we have about 60 uh Barbados black belly at the moment. It varies depending on where we are in lambing and sales. Uh, we still have Labradors and we have three livestock guardian dogs. So we can surround ourselves with animals and nature 24 seven and the pandemic really has minimal impact on our daily lives. Very nice, very nice. So, uh, sounds like from a previous conversation that uh, Pam is really focused on companion animals in her practice, in her veterinary practice, and, and you focused on large livestock? I, I was interested in farm animals and mm -hmm. Pam was interested in pets. Mm -hmm. So the combination was wonderful. Uh, and in our careers, we ended up doing a lot of different things and living in a lot of places. So I think I mentioned to you that we've moved 12 times since 1980 um, and both in the U.S. and uh, in England for a short while. And over the course of that, we made a commitment to each other that we would retire to a small farm. Now, I wow. got to the small farm before I retired, <laughs> but uh, thankfully Pam was still allowed me to join her after I stopped uh, my work. But most we spent most of our careers, uh, we both had practice experience. Uh, I was a farm veterinarian. Uh, Pam did a small animal practice. Uh, we both have taught in universities. I spent a stint in, the, in government in both the US and, and Great Britain. And um, I ended up, we both ended up at, with positions at University of Minnesota. So it is just about 70 degrees outside. And for any Minnesota sheep farmers or fiber artists that are watching, I feel so sorry for you in terms of your weather. But we enjoy having four seasons again and um, the sheep do too. Mm -hmm. You got some pictures of your farm. Yeah, I oh, wanted yeah. to. Yeah, I wanted to highlight. It's we. It's called Springwood Farm. We have a number of springs in the woods, as you might have guessed. And we've also been committed to conservation, not only in terms of livestock or rare breeds, but also in the context of the environment. So we have done a lot to reduce our footprint, to protect the watershed and uh, to better, actually you might say farm grass. So mm -hmm. here's a picture, a aerial photo of some of our farm, the house there in the, in the right. Actually, we recently purchased the property next door. So the other house uh, is also part of ours. And what it does is gives us a lot of different paddocks. So we can rotate paddocks in the summer giving the, the sheep um, green grass on a regular basis and allowing the grass that they've grazed to regenerate 
so it's we're real excited about it, enjoy it, and and just feel we live in a beautiful part of the country. It does look beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got this great picture of Pim with some yous. Yep, so you can see a couple things from this picture. One, how much Pam really enjoys being with the sheep. I mean, she just, um, when we do chores, sheep chores, uh, Pam takes a, considerably longer than I do. And part of it is that she just enjoys sitting down with the sheep and, and interacting. Um, and these are, we work very hard to, to um, train our sheep to be friendly. And it really pays off for us. And that carries over as when we sell starter flocks that people are real excited. They can interact with the sheep as well. Mm -hmm. It looks like those use like. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> there, we go. there we go. I'll turn the speaker off. I apologize. I'm You're not good. on emergency call. <laughs> good. <laughs> it looks like those users are enjoying Pam as much as she was enjoying them. Yeah. I think it's a two-way street. Yeah. Well, how did you and Pam come to sheep? Well, we we had always wanted to be to, to live in a rural area to have animals. Uh, I really much of my work, veterinary work, was with cattle. And I thought, great, we'll get cows. And I had a friend gave me some cows to start out. And um, we have a small property and cows are big animals. Mm -hmm. So it just, they, they, it was hard to manage very many. And uh, we just felt, I was traveling much of the time and Pam said, well, you know, I need something that I can work with more easily than, than the cows. So we kind of harkened back. I had done a master's degree in preventive medicine and focused on sheep, uh, studied sheep mastitis and strategies we might use to prevent that. Um, and as a result, I really enjoyed my work with sheep. So we said, well, let's try sheep. And we went to the Livestock Conservancy website and looked at the, <laughs> looked at the priority list and we started down the list. This kind of leads into why in the world that we end up with uh, Barbados black belly, but we said, oh, there are lots of options here. And we started visiting people with different type of sheep and we fell in love with the uh, Barbados and, and that's the beginning and the, the story continues. And how long have you been raising Barbados black bellies? I think we're about, uh, gosh, that's a good question. I should have asked Pam to remind me. I think we're closing in, we're eight or nine years now. Wow, great. And what did you, so you, you looked at a lot of sheep, you looked down our conservation priority list, you got an idea that there's wool sheep, there's, I mean, you probably already knew that, wool sheep, that, pear yeah. sheep, yeah. yeah. So how did you come to the decision of Barbados specifically? What were the kind of the key things that you guys were looking for? In a sheep? Well, one, we're both veterinarians, right? So. Mm -hmm. uh, we both had experience with animals and wanted to look to at a, for a breed that was hardy. And uh, among the problems that people most commonly have with sheep, uh, one is medical and the other is husbandry. And the medical problem um, has to do with the, the parasites, mm -hmm. worms they pick up. And so we said, hey, you know, uh, there are some breeds out there that are more resistant to parasites and why not? Because then we have to use, we use very little dewormer here and, and that's better for us and the environment and the sheep. Mm -hmm. uh, the management issue is uh, in many parts of the country, especially like Virginia, where there are not a whole lot of sheep, it is difficult to get someone to shear. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want to do it. Uh, and we said, well, gosh, if look at that, amazingly enough, they're breeds that just shed their wool on their own or all their fiber. So why not? Mm -hmm. um, we wanted something that's relatively hardy. Uh, we had uh, in the, you know, that would graze a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And um, so we went and started looking at, at sheep breeds. We also wanted good mothers. Uh, mm -hmm. Sheep that, that didn't have a problem breeding. And, you know, most sheep breeds are seasonal breeders. 
-hmm. And it turns out that these um, Barbados blackbelly will breed all, any time of the year. Anytime wow. there's a ram, a ewe will be receptive. So we kind of put all of that together. Uh, I'd also work with some very large breeds. And quite candidly, when you get a ram that's up in the 250 pound area, that's a handful. And I, I thought, well, let's, let's get a breed that's a little bit smaller. So we started looking and went to visit different people. And basically it was, at the end of the day, it was looks that did it. Uh, you know, <laughs> Barbados black belly just really captured our attention and we love the way they look. I think I included several pictures there. Uh, that just gives you an idea. They, they're distinctive. Um, mm. Here we are. Here. Yep, a group. Is that the right one? Let's see. That's one. A uh, group of animals in the snow. So they're resilient in a variety of weather. You'll see the one on the right. The snow's falling off the trees onto the sheep, <laughs> and it doesn't phase them. No. They're very attractive sheep. Yeah. So this is a group of rams. You can see the big uh, rough in the front, and mm -hmm. they're sort of rough and mane, and they can be quite striking. I think there are a couple pictures. Well, now that's farther along. Let's save that for the fiber. <laughs> you look, there's a picture of a black and white picture of a couple lambs. Yes. No. Uh, a cute, <laughs> you know. So okay. these little guys, you know, I don't know. They have personalities. They're they unique. They have a lot of different. Some of them are darker, or lighter, and we mm -hmm. just we thought this is the breed for us. They stole your heart, huh? They stole our heart. Yeah. yeah. So, Will, you were talking about liking them because they're not a super large breed. What is their mature weight, roughly, for ewes and, and rams? Our ewes vary from about 80 pounds to 120. Oh, and the rams, yeah, the rams will be, the largest ram we have is probably 150 pounds. Mm -hmm. so they'd be more in the neighborhood of a mature ram, 100 to 150. Mm -hmm. That's still a good sized animal, but not as hard to move around when you need to. Well, we have found they move around remarkably well if you use crackers. <laughs> do you have that picture, Brittany, or that video? I do have that video. <laughs> Pam training with crackers, yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes, that's very. <laughs> she was awesome. Yeah, she was remarkably gentle in taking the crackers too. They are most of them. It's especially if they're by themselves or a small group. When mm -hmm. there's a large group, you know, there's some that really like to be up front, and it can be get a little little pushy there. But uh, <laughs> we try to give everyone equal equal opportunity. <laughs> that's fair. So let's see, did we hit on, oh, well, we, did you mention that they're polled? That was one of the other great things that about the breed is that they're naturally right. polled. Um, right. And uh, horns, for us, horns just presented another management uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. And so I, we thought we'd go with a polled sheep. Mm -hmm. And they are on, like you said, they are on our conservation priority list. Do you remember what they are classified? I think they're on the watch list now. So they've moved up a bit. Uh, there's been an active Barbados Black Belly uh, Sheep Association that's mm -hmm. really worked and nurtured. There's that cat. Yeah. Come up with a, <laughs> a real uh, committed core group of people. And they've done a lot to help encourage new farmers to adopt black bellies and and also to kind of spread the word about their many benefits. And that's also one of the things that you and Pam are doing is as far as you know what how you're using the breed on your farm. Right. Um, we we both of us spent much of our careers as educators. Uh, if you have well you have a cat there obviously you'll know that when you go visit a veterinarian a big part of what they provide is actually education. 
And we worked with clients and their animals. We have both taught in veterinary schools, uh, worked with various organizations. Uh, and I also worked with uh, government agencies, both here in the US and in other countries. So we like the education part. We enjoy seeing people gain new knowledge and skills and be able to apply it. So a big part of our, our sheep enterprise is selling starter flocks and to most of them new farmers. And so we invite the individuals to come visit us and we can walk around the property and show them, um, let them interact with the sheep, talk to them about the management, the health considerations, the housing, the uh, how feeding, et cetera. And then for many people, we end up going and visiting them as well. And we can walk around their property and give them some tips. As a result, the, I would say the majority of the people to whom we've sold sheep uh, keep in touch. And nice. the other may return at another time to get some additional sheep, but they tell us of their successes and we share compassion for their failures. And uh, it's a wonderful interaction uh, that we have. And it's really, in a sense, expanding on that very strong support system that the BBSAI, the Barbados Black Belly Sheep Association has as well among its key members. I think you've it's, got a couple of photos of that. Um, let's see. Is it with Pam and the lambs and the friend? Yep. There's a, a good example. Here's a friend that came over. That was a year. We had a ewe with triplets. Um, and unfortunately, she had lost one half of her udder. So oh. she had three lambs on, on one teat, and that was a bit much. So uh, we supplemented with a bottle, and Pam had one of her friends come over. And you can get an idea. There are the lambs chilling in the background and the ewes around. And it's, um, as I said earlier, we do a lot to help to keep our, our animals friendly. And we would do the same thing with people that, uh, breeders that come and give them an example, of, help them learn about sheep and sheep management. Because we want the sheep to be healthy. We want them to be productive in that environment. And we want the people to feel satisfied. Absolutely. I think you had one of socializing puppies. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, Pam, Pam actually uh, bred Labradors, Labrador Retrievers for a number of years and provided, I think, 79 puppies to service dog organizations uh -huh. for training as service animals. And a big part of that is to socialize the young puppies. So you see the Black Lab puppy there. <laughs> We one of our weathers um, was was uh, very comfortable around people and other animals, and he would come up and the lambs would get all over him, and it didn't phase him, and it really helped them become less afraid. And at the same time, uh, he can help entertain our guests as he is with the the friend that there, Dominique, that's out with the puppies. <laughs> that's adorable. Yes. Oh, he liked this. He liked the slide as well. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great video. <laughs> so, well, check. There's a picture there about the young rams or the rams, ram lambs. I think they are. There you go. You know, oh. Barbados are, are well. Most people, when they see them, say, "Oh, it's a goat." <laughs> and while they're sheep, not goats, they do in fact have some characteristics that are more goat-like. Uh, one of which is they're very inquisitive and very athletic. So obviously I made this little shelter out of a, you might not be able to tell, but it's an upturned large bale feeder that I just put oh. some horse stall mats on the top and a, a, over top a tarp on it. And it works fantastically. <laughs> anyway, they discovered that they could jump up on top of it and it's, they play king of the mountain up there on a regular regular basis. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the other the other aspect of which these sheep are are a little bit like goats is they like to browse. Mm -hmm. So they like brush, they like trees, yeah. and in fact, we've sold sheep to several people who have used them to clear old fields where that are overgrown and they're <laughs> tickled to death because they will they'll find something to eat. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Very smart sheep, huh? Very smart sheep. And they learn. They learn what they have to do to get treats. They learn uh, how to interact with the other animals. Right now, we, <laughs> you know, in the grass farming business, also retired. I want to minimize the workload. So, the sheep actually will come into the yard and graze the yard. And I thought, oh, this is going to be super. You know, mm -hmm. they're going to come in and help keep the yard under control. Well, they do that, but they also like to climb up on the back porch and um, mess around the dog's house. And, and so they're <laughs> very inquisitive and remarkably bold. And we get a big chuckle out of that. Since we're talking about how smart they are, the uh, the Amelia sheep trick is that the video where Pam is showing the Pam the, taught this is a friend of Pam's she came over to visit Pam was showing the other showing some more tricks I think there's a tape of Pam with a weather called Hobbit in there that does a series of tricks and it's a there's a YouTube link on the on the paper I gave you mm -hmm. and so her friend was amazed and Pam said well it's not that difficult to treat to train your sheep to do tricks. And so she turned around and trained Amelia to feed the, the use some crackers. <laughs> Brittany, can you pull that up or should we keep going? I'm pulling up the YouTube one. That one is super cute. There we are. All right, I'm gonna share my screen real quick because it is adorable. Pam uses this the the animal tricks as well to amuse our visitors and when people come to the house, especially the nieces and nephews. Oh yeah, I bet. <laughs> so there's the kneeling, crawling. Good boy. Uh, very good boy. Good boy. Now he's gonna jump over my leg. Yeah. Now how old is this this ram? It's the weather. And oh, okay. at that point in time, he looks to be uh, less than two years old. So he's not, he's not quite full grown. Now, since he's a weather, will he develop that rough or is that more? He will more... not develop the rough. So that's hormone induced. That's really hormone induced. Pam's trying to get them to fetch. And he's got part of that down. But, uh, he doesn't fetch as well as the Labradors. <laughs> So he, there's one of our livestock guardian dogs that's come up. Uh, I think he got the idea there might be treats and, you know, he wants a treat too. Sure. Great boy. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, she really enjoys it. And of course the animals like to teach each other tricks. So I think there's a video in there of Kenai with one of the rams. So uh, the horse, we let the horse in with the sheep uh, at times, and and he they just developed this real buddy buddy relationship. And um, the, one of the most amusing parts is Pam would take feed out, and the horse and the ram would eat out of the same little bowl. Aww. We've got a bowl about yay big, and they're both down there, both heads down in there, a horse head and a ram head. Just walking away. All right, I'm going to put this one on. So here's Kenai <laughs> grooming the ram. You know, he wow. would just lick and lick, and he just really enjoyed it, and the ram loved it. So they were big buddies. Good friends. <laughs> well, let's, let's backtrack a little bit about um, your priorities, yours and Pam's priorities. One of... One of the things you said is is definitely getting starter flocks out to folks and doing some yep. mentorship. But your breeding program is is a specific type of breeding. You are conservation breeding. Would you yes. like to talk about that a little bit? I'm happy to. Ah, shoot. <laughs> we... Um, we're very impressed with this, the whole approach to conservation of livestock and, and animals overall. And it turns out that years ago, I made friends with, I guess more than 35 years ago, a guy named Phil Sponnenberg. And Phil Sponnenberg wrote this, this book 
um, along with two people from the from the uh, Life Cycle Conservancy, Allison and Jeanette. And we just, we so we talked to Phil, we got his input actually when we picked a breed and then we got his input and Pam set up the breeding scheme. So we looked around the United States and found that there were several different lines. There have been relatively few of these Barbados uh, black bellies that have come into the U.S. There were some that came in about 1907 and then another group in the 70s. And we found some that had, uh, let's say, some distinctive characteristics. And so Pam has, our goal is to develop three U lines, uh, ten, at least 10 U's in each line, mm -hmm. along with some replacement U lambs in each line. And then we keep a group of rams. Pam likes to call them the heir and the spare. <laughs> so at least two rams in each of the lines. And she does both line breeding and, and cross breeding, out breeding following a lot of Phil's principles and so that we can maintain the greatest genetic diversity in our flock. And so she can help others to get animals that are not closely related so that they can use them. Um, in our visits with breeders and, and our chance to interact with a lot of sheep people, some of the new farmers simply say, oh, well, all I need is a male and a female. And so we have found people that just bred basically father to father to daughters and just kept that up for years and years. And they're really highly inbred. And that is a, has a tendency to bring out some of the negative characteristics. Mm -hmm. It also is you're losing genetic diversity. So we have purchased sheep from uh, a, a number of people over the years. And we have try, really tried to maximize our diversity. I, I want to put a plug in here, though. As a veterinarian, as two veterinarians, we learned a lesson that we teach, and we were a little bit too fast and loose with bringing sheep onto the property. So we purchased some sheep that had a chronic disease called ovine progressive pneumonia. Oh. Some people don't think it's a problem. Uh, for us, it was, in fact, a problem. We lost sheep to a clinical disease, and by the time we realized what it was, we tested the whole flock, half of our sheep were affected. Oh, man. So we faced some very difficult uh, decisions. We split the flock. Uh, we put a, had a positive flock and a negative flock. We also worked with the researchers that are working on the disease. Uh, most of them were with U.S. Department of Agriculture. We worked with the, there's an OPP society and we came up with a management plan for ourselves. And it turns out that you can manage your way out of the disease in the sense that the sheep that are infected will always be infected. Mm -hmm. but the, their lambs are not necessarily infected. So we were able to salvage some lambs from some of the positive animals. Mm -hmm. And then over time, we developed an entirely negative flock and we still have that and we're quite proud of it. And we advertise when we sell sheep that they are free of ovine progressive pneumonia. And thankfully, they're free of a lot of other issues that people often buy. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, a, it was a nice reiteration of the care that must be taken in terms of moving animals from multiple flocks or, or herds and commingling them. So mm -hmm. now if we bring new sheep in, we isolate them. We do a series of tests and they're usually isolated for two to three months as we go through a series of tests to make sure that they're not carrying any disease that might hurt the rest of the flock because our, our flock is actually more important than any individual animal. Yeah, with that many different genetic lines, definitely. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Wow, what a, what a thing to have to go through, but good job on wiping it out how it long was. did that how long did that take how many generations it took us about two years okay um and you know to get to build back up to our, our sheep numbers with all negative animals mm -hmm. uh, part way along the way the the process we face the difficult decision of what do we do with the positive animals um some had already developed into clinical disease. Others were simply carrying the virus, but not affected yet. 
And we made the decision, you know, some, there's one school of thought that says you should simply euthanize all of them. Uh, we thought that would be a pretty hard hit for a rare breed. Mm -hmm. So we were quite open and candid uh, about the, the situation. We had someone that came from, uh, from Eastern Tennessee that wanted to start with the, the, wanted to get some sheep that did not wanted, didn't have a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so we worked with him, with he and his wife, and they understood the, the situation and they basically adopted that part of the flock. We still keep up with them. We're still good friends. And they've also given extra special attention. We had two sheep that were uh, really of the pet quality and including the one you saw doing the tricks. Aww. His name was Hobbit and he was positive, unfortunately. So uh, they moved down to Tennessee and they're still doing well and still getting all the attention they, they want. Uh, meanwhile, he's gone through several generations and he has a lot of sheep that are, that are doing just fine. That's great. That's a really great story. <laughs> so what else besides breeding stock, what else are you doing with these beautiful animals? I hate to ask this question because I know how dear they are to you and Pam, but are you selling for meat or are you keeping yes, any for meat yourself? Okay. I believe, you know, now we, we talk and we will talk about uh, shave them to save them. Mm -hmm. And uh, there used to be, I think, another bumper sticker from Livestock Conservancy that basically said you have to eat them to, to help them to survive. Yeah, eat them to save them. them. Yeah. So we, we um, again, both of us feel very strongly that if we are going to eat meat, then we need to recognize and accept the full responsibility that we raise animals that later become come to our table as, mm -hmm. as a meal. And so our target is to give them the best quality of life, the most humane uh, processing uh, into food, and then to use as much as possible to, in other words, avoid wasting anything for all the, uh, all that we've put into it. So we have sold uh, meat, cuts of meat. I personally am not, don't especially like that marketing aspect. Mm -hmm. But we found now that there are there is a market and we have people that come and buy ram lambs and raise the ram lambs themselves and then either do a home slaughter or pay to have them processed. Mm -hmm. I should point out that one of the unique aspects of this breed, and it may be related to the fact that they, they are hair sheep, they shed their their fiber, they have they do have an undercoat, a woolly coat, but they have a lot less lanolin. The sort of natural grease on the fibers. And the, the meat is very, very mild. So we find that a lot of people that perhaps don't like lamb, uh, the, the more traditional lamb, uh, really will eat and enjoy this meat. Um, so it's been a nice market for it. We still sell some meat. Unfortunately, I was bitten by a tick here on the property and developed this, what they call alpha gal, alpha gal oh. um, syndrome, which I'm allergic now to all red meat. So mm. here we raise meat sheep and I'm allergic to meat, but uh, nevertheless, um, we press on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Emu. I heard emu is a good alternative for that. Uh, <laughs> Don't ask me why. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's okay. Right. We'll bypass that. <laughs> well, well, let me say it this way. We were looking for a resilient breed, a hardy breed that we could raise with uh, minimal husbandry requirements. Mm -hmm. And for us, the, the Barbados Black Belly fit that bill. Yeah. You know, I think you wanted to talk a little bit about where the breed came from. I did. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of an interesting story. Uh, back in the days uh, in the 1600s, uh, um, when the slave trade was going, was prior to refrigeration. So ships, as they came from sailing from uh, up in, from Europe or Africa to the United States, they would put live animals on board. 
and those live animals would be the meat for the, the voyage. Or they would put they also put chickens on so the captain could have his eggs in the morning. They put a milk on so they would have cream for his coffee or tea. So it was a much different situation than we see now. Well, apparently, as the slavers of the time would go to Africa to pick up the slaves, they would also stock up from with sheep from West Africa. And when they got to the Caribbean, where which was the initial destination for some of the, the slave trade, then they would drop off. If they had any animals left, they would just drop them off because they didn't want to have to deal with cleaning up after the animals uh, once they, they had other sources of, of fresh, fresh food. So these sheep uh, on the island of Barbados were kind of free ranging and they cared for themselves largely. Uh, they enter interbred. Along the time, the, the folks in Barbados tried crossbreeding them with some other animals, some of which, which were more woolly. But uh, the Barbados worked well in, in that climate, in that more tropical climate with the parasite resistance and the fact that they, they had a mostly hair coat and would shed their, their coat on a regular basis. So that was really the origin. So in our minds, this is, again, a celebration of, um, of this breed. It's also a recognition that, uh, of the history and the heritage that we all have. And, and some of what happened in the course of that. So we feel it's important to, to protect this breed and that they have some genetic qualities that we hope will help sheep, sheep uh, populations for years to come. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you talked a little bit about the Barbados Black Belly Sheep Association. When, when did they get involved in this breed? Is it, you said they were in Barbados and how, how right. did they get to the states and was the association formed before that or after that far long after so okay. the first group that we know that recorded group of barbados black belly that came to the united states were 1904 uh, one of the other big importations we know about is in the 1970s so when they first came over they had a real there was quite an appeal for them in some of the more arid parts of the united states like Texas and, and some of the Great Plains or lower uh, southwest of the United States. And interestingly enough, um, over the years, there developed quite a trophy hunting business. So they crossed the, the Barbados black belly with uh, mouflon, a wild horn sheep, and with rambouillet. So they get these larger animals, larger sheep with big racks of horn, big horns. Mm -hmm. And then people would come in and pay to hunt them. Uh, in 1996, the Breed Association was formed, and it was a small group of breeders that recognized that there were that the the original stock was polled, had no horns, and that now you had this whole variation in the United States. So they said, "Let's see if we can preserve the original uh, breed or, or animals with the original breed characteristics." So they uh, went out in the United States and set up the association and started looking for animals um, to register. By the mid or early 2000s, 2007, I guess it was, they could only, they only had 110 registered sheep. And that's when uh, this was far, far higher in the, in the, unfortunately, the priority list. Um, but they said, okay, we're going to then we respect what was done with the Amer with the uh, bringing the horns to the breed, and we'll call that a separate. We'll call that the American black belly, mm -hmm. and then we will maintain the Barbados black belly as the polled animals, and that work has continued, um, and the breed still shows some of the influence of the wool breeds with whom they interbred over the years, and that's why there's a different level of wooliness in some. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that fiber a little bit, because as you as you briefly alluded to, we want to, of course, talk about Shave Them to Save Them as well today. And you are selling hair to fiber artists. We are. We it was something actually I, I <laughs> several years ago, 
in the spring and summer, we have this piles of this air that shed. Some of them share little clumps in the field. Some of them will come off in great big swatches of matted hair. And so I contacted Allison and said, what's the, you know, do you know anybody that's using this? And her response was, no, I don't. Uh, here's some other people you might contact. And I was never able to find anybody that was actually using it. And lo and behold, here comes the Shave Them to Save Them program. And hip, hip, hooray for the Livestock Conservancy for also Woo. including the hair sheep. Of course. Uh, well, it turns out there are not very many hair sheep producers that that or breeders that have that offer this. Mm -hmm. So we've provided fiber now to more than fifty uh, fiber artists mm -hmm. that have a variety of levels of interest. And I think last year we we collected and sold more than seventeen pounds to more than forty different fiber artists. This year we already. In 2021, I already sent out three, three pounds of fiber uh, to five artists. So we're well on the way. I brought some of the fiber to show you uh, a little bit of the, the variation. Do you remember the picture you saw with the, the rams? Mm -hmm. The rams well, that were shedding? Yeah. Yeah. That's a U. So there's a U oh. shedding. And they look, you see, they look a little ratty at this stage. This is you call solar, and she would lose the fiber on her flanks, but didn't keep that on the along the top and along the back of her legs. Mm -hmm. So they, they they shed with different patterns. But here's a example, if you will. The, this is the main the rough in the front of the rams. Well, it's nine inches long. Sorry, let me get it. Wow, here. So pretty stunning, and that's the very different characteristic than some of the fiber that. You know, if I were to show you this little clump, mm -hmm. I mean, that doesn't look all that much different than what you might find in some hair breed or some uh, wool well, breeds. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. From the ram's rough, it looks very much like coarse hair. But that second cl little clip that you held up looks like wool. Is there any hair in that at all? Yes. In fact, if you look at one of our fiber artists, Grace McFetter, did a... Um, she actually spent quite a bit of effort, there you oh. go, in separating the hair and the more wool part of it mm -hmm. and the hairs on the bottom. Um, and she, her interest, interestingly enough, is to make brushes. She wants to, to see what she can make with the hair. Huh. So the wool part was a byproduct, but she wrote and said that she was surprised because it's very light and very soft and she was really impressed with it. Mm -hmm. Now the fiber artists. Uh, this is this is in fact some of the yarn that she spun out of that more woolly part. Um, some of the fiber artists that are using the uh, the entire the the entire shed, mm -hmm. uh, they end up with a product that's a little more. Um, how should I say? It's it the fiber is quite variable. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, and they can do some really interesting things. I, I asked this uh, fiber artist or invited them to send me some examples. Mm -hmm. We have some great examples of the different things they've developed. Uh, let me go through some of those. Um, we have Allison Parrott who has made some interesting little, this is a coaster. Nice. So she felt it a little coaster and she wrote and she said, well, one thing I like about it is it doesn't matter if it gets wet. <laughs> you know, so it makes a great coaster. Uh, I thought that was what a, what a cute idea. <laughs> yeah. We talked about uh, Grace Mc, McFetters and her going to use the hair. Um, we have, let's see, who else did I? Leslie. Okay, Leslie Long, I'll talk about her last maybe. Oh, Marcella um, Edmonds. Marcella Edmonds did a really interesting <gasps> thing. It's beautiful. Wow. She's made a quilt and I'm sorry, I don't remember the number of breeds she has. The Barbados, it's right below the, the, uh, the little patch that says Barbados. That's what she mm -hmm. wove from that, fi the fiber from us. Neat. And you can see she's got a huge, quite an extensive quilt now with all of these different breeds, which I think is a wonderful application. 
That's a neat idea. Yeah. Uh, Karen Lehman uh, contacted us and when she originally got it and she shared that she makes likes to make puppets or these little uh, dolls. And so this is a puppet she made modeled after one of our rams, a ram named Quiznos. So you can see the rough in the front and she goes and does, does uh, programs and takes, takes little Quiznos with her. Uh, That's and I, she just sent me a note uh, yesterday and said, Will, I'm sorry, I keep bothering you, but do all sheep have the same color eyes? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have to do a little work on that. Uh, <laughs> I want it to be realistic. <laughs> and then the last artist that I, I want to highlight or give a shout out to um, is, is Leslie Horan Simon. And Leslie's been a, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, colleague in, in this whole venture. And she makes, she is a fiber artist in the sense she makes artwork. So she has a very interesting felting technique. She actually weaves, um, there we are, that she's Ooh. woven that material or that you can see the, the bats, the, the um, what she's, and then ultimately the, she, the yarn and then what she's woven from that. But look at the, then she does a process that kind of felts those. And I think there's another picture or two there that shows that's one of her oh. wall wow. hangs with all different breeds. And her comment to me was, Will, um, it's pretty amazing because the some of the brown color you can get with some of the Barbados is a color we don't find very commonly. And hmm. so she's ordered fiber several times and used it in a number of her activities. And she has an amazing website. I don't know if uh, Brittany can pull that up, but it's a fascinating website that she has that that of the various things she does. And she sells some of her products to quite famous movie stars and musicians and all kinds of things. She's in New York City. I'm not surprised that wall hanging was gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. She also, um, some of your listeners might be interested, but she's been very, very uh, collaborative with Pam and myself. And she even wrote a, a nice little uh, article in the newsletter for the Barbados uh, Black Belly Sheep Association, describing her process and taking through the whole from the raw fiber into her artwork. And that's actually available and anyone wants to go on the BBSAI website and look under information and they'll list the newsletters. And it's in, I think, the November newsletter of last year. Uh, November so 2020. Okay. I'm definitely going to look that up. That sounds like something our fiber artists could use for sure. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. November 2019. 2019. Correction. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Will. Yeah. <laughs> Those are some very creative artists for sure. And we've, we've had a couple in the Shave Them to Save Them group, too, that have done some really interesting things. I don't have any of their pictures handy, but we weren't sure when we started this program if anything could be done with the hair braids, with the fiber from the hair braids. And it is really surprising us <laughs> what it some is. creative makers out there can accomplish with it. And all these people were very anxious to get their stamp. They're collecting <laughs> their uh, Shave Them to Save Them stamps. For their passport. Yeah. Passport. Actually, the, the demand for the stamps is such that I keep writing you for more stamps. So uh, I think we're set for a little while, but you can expect to hear from me later this summer. <laughs> for those of you watching this video today and are not currently enrolled in Shave Them to Save Them, Shave Them to Save Them is a program that helps support rare breeds. It helps keep rare breeds working so that we can keep farmers keeping the, the breeds going, keeping them in production and giving the, the sheep a job to do. There are so many wonderful breeds, 23 as a matter of fact, on our conservation priority list and their fibers range from very fine to a mixed 
and mixed uh, fiber that's both a soft wool and a coarser outer coat that you can use together. You can split apart and use in separate projects. And then of course there are three hair breeds on the on the conservation priority list as well, including the Barbados Black Belly that we're talking about today. So if you'd like to learn more about the program, possibly join, get your creative juices flowing on a new project, rarewool.org has all your info. Great. Well, I just wanted to share that Leslie also sent us a sample of her artwork. Oh, wow. And this, um, she sent us also a little, a key that shows us which animal is which or which breed is which. And it was so neat to get that and to be able to have and, and hold and touch a real yeah. product that came from this. So yeah. again, we've been I'd say there's an that's one of the added benefits of Shave Them to Save Them. It's really connected us to to the fiber artists, and we try to send out a little update on the sheep from from time to time. And okay. it's just a real nice feeling of having this uh, larger community of people committed to to breed conservation. Mm -hmm. It's fun for both sides. It is fun for both sides. <laughs> So you wanted to do a couple of shout outs, I think, today. Before I we did. <laughs> uh, one of them I talked, you know, certainly a reiteration. Uh, Phil Sponenberg is a huge resource. Um, you can get a hold of him through the, through the uh, Livestock Conservancy. The Barbados Black Belly Sheep Association, and they do some neat things. You can even see they put out a little, uh, get this down, uh, a recipe book. Oh, nice. Wow. It's, it's kind of, you know, kind of a neat thing to, it also gave a chance for a number of the, um, the raisers to people raising the sheep to be able to, to share some of their tips on how they prepare the meat. We were contacted by an, a photographer from New York City, um, Eliza, Eliza Roth who asked to come to the farm and if she could, she, uh, she's interested in heritage breeds and asked if she could take pictures of some of our sheep. She came and from that, she generated a book. I think actually you have this as a picture. It may actually show up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can see that the photos she uses in the book are amazing. She sent us a number of the photos, or copies of the photos she didn't necessarily use. And, you might find a couple of those nice. I think I sent you one of a ram, Dumas. Mm, uh, and pretty striking. He's and stunning. That big, big rough and mane. Um, and you can see the that brown color that Leslie talks about. Well, how old is Dumas? In this picture, he would have been about two years. Wow. He's still going strong. Um, in fact, I believe he is now residing uh, in, at Virginia State University. They have one of the largest flocks of Barbados black bellies as a research flock. Mm -hmm. And the shepherd there, the, the faculty member that has been working with them, Stefan Wildius, is another tremendous asset for the breed. And he's helped us because he's uh, worked on some artificial insemination approaches. So a way that we can, we could actually get some new genetics in without having to risk reintroducing OPP or other diseases. So uh, Stefan is a super guy. Uh, Eliza took another interesting photo I wanted to share. Uh, we not only have the sheep, we also have a rare dog breed. So this is Bear, one of our Karakachans. We currently have two. Uh, one of the neighbors has a few, and so we've collaborated on some breeding. But to give you an idea, this, doesn't, this does not share anything about his size. So let me show you Bear along beside uh, one of our Labrador's rows, and you'll get a size. <gasps> wow. So he's 120 pounds. He jumps all of our fences. So he goes <laughs> into the pasture where he's needed. And I uh, used to run up the end of the drive every day to meet the next door neighbor's school children when the bus arrived. Aww. Now he's quite a character. Right? Uh, we have had no problems of uh, predators getting to our sheep. It's a Bulgarian uh, sheep livestock guarding dog. 
originally developed to, to protect sheep from wolves and bears. And bears. Yeah. He's so, an impressive dog. He's an impressive <laughs> dog, and he made the book. <laughs> well, little did we know that Eliza had another interesting uh, project underway, working with the U.S. Post Postal Service. And she worked with them to develop a set of heritage breeds, a breed stamps. And I think if you can, Brittany, you might be able to pull up that website and it has a picture of the block of breeds because we were thrilled to see that uh, Barbados Black Belly is one of the breeds that's going to be highlighted mm -hmm. as just emblematic of the, the sheep breeds. So I think what it shows to us is, is really how wonderful the community is and all the interesting people you can meet. The critical or seminal role that's played by Livestock Conservancy to connect people. We continue to get contacts from fiber artists or people looking for, for breeding stock that have found us through the Livestock Conservancy. So that's a, been a real plus for us. I wanted to, the other group I wanted to highlight or really uh, shout out, give a shout out for, oh, there we are. I don't know if you can blow it up or show the, there's the stamps right there in the middle and, oh, look at that, oh, yeah. impressive. So a uh, pig, a chicken, a cow, a turkey, a, <laughs> a donkey, a goose, a goat, a horse, a duck, and a sheep. So it's really fun. Uh, and I think it's I, I think it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful op opportunity, a window of opportunity for us to do some tremendous um, communications and education about heritage breeds. Absolutely. So we're real excited about it. The last group I wanted to highlight is called the SVF Foundation. It stood for Swiss Valley Farm, which was a little farm developed by an individual in Newport, Rhode Island, amazingly enough, and it's now the only farm in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, he passed on, but he endowed the, that the farm could continue as a livestock operation. And this SVF Foundation partnered with the Smithsonian Institute to do a project for rare breed conservation. So over the last 20 years, they have worked with, to, with uh, 26 U.S. livestock breeds to collect semen and embryos to kind of protect that genetic heritage. And we were absolutely thrilled that they approached the Barbados Black Belly Association uh, and offered to include the breed as the last breed they would be able to include. Uh, so... We've become increasingly popular just for doing this this webcast. People are just <laughs> calling us. The phone's ringing off the hook. <laughs> um, so anyway, Swiss Valley Foundation and the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, Pam worked with some real key players from the from the uh, Barbados Black Belly Association, Becky Lannon and Bridget Leslie. They phone called. Uh, all of the breeders of Barbados black bellies that, that we have on our in the records and invited them to participate. Wow. And in the end, they identified, I think it's uh, six breeders that were willing to send sheep up to, to Rhode Island. Uh, SVF covered the cost, but here it was pretty striking. So the, I just wanted to call out their names because it gives you an idea of yet another a way in which I credit Livestock Conservancy and the Barbados Black Valley Association for stimulating some of this interest. Rita Gill from Washington, Elma, Washington, Sundi Prechtel from Riverside, California, uh, Elaine Haas in Hillsborough, Missouri, uh, Sandy Hessian in Thorndike, Massachusetts, Lita Hazlitt in uh, Cohocton, New York, and ourselves in Free Union. And all of that was supported by two Barbados breeders in Texas. Uh, so we all, all of us worked together to get this group of about 22 ewes and nine rams up to Newport, Rhode Island. They're just about finished their, their work up there and they will be going to new homes. So the neat thing about it is that it's also helping us in terms of the genetic diversity. So mm -hmm. some of our sheep will end up in California and Washington and New York as a result of this program. 
And we'll also get back some of our ewes bred to rams from some of these other places. So we're really nice. Excited. Yeah. Well, I see you. We're just past the hour mark. I know, uh, Sandra, you wanted to, to target that hour. Was there anything else you wanted me to touch on before we sign off? Uh, that was a very thorough overview of Barbados Blackbelly. I, I commend you. That was fantastic. I think that uh, that was perfect. It was. We have more photos if you would like to go through some of them. Oh, sure. yeah. Let's do that. Okay. A little photo montage. I think we've got this one of uh, you with all the yeah. babies. So the, the ewes typically have twins. Um, first time you lambs will have a, often may have a single, and then we have a group of ewes that has triplets and one ewe that had quads. But oh, wow. you can see that the ewes, some of the ewes are great, well, all the ewes are great mothers. And this one in particular was very popular with the lambs. Mm -hmm. So you see all the, the, all the lambs crowding up around the ewe back under the heat light. <laughs> so, um, we thought that was a great picture. It is. It's adorable. We have some lambs at the feeder. There you go. The uh, lambs, they're really cute when they're young. They have um, a variety of markings. Uh, they'll have slight different, some different color in their hair, and we just get a big charge out of them. They're real cute. Mm -hmm. and Indiana Jones. Indiana Ooh. Jones, a stunning ram, and he has that reddish color that is more common in Barbados. There still are Barbados black belly on the island. They're not exported Ooh. anymore. They, they set up a farm to try to um, sit, preserve the breed on Barbados. We haven't had a visit yet, but the Barbados sheep have this reddish color. Indiana Jones is a ram that we purchased from Sandy Hessian in, in Connecticut. And he's now, um, he, fathered a number of lambs at our at our farm and we were able to sell him to yet another breeder to uh, pass on the genetic diversity. Pam has developed a wonderful network. We have, I guess, about five breeders here in central Virginia that uh, we share information. We pass on clients if we don't have what they want or we work to help new farmers to get the genetic diversity to start out a really healthy flock. So it's been a, it's really wonderful to have those neighbors and to have that type of collaboration. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, here's a you. I'm sorry, I don't have a before picture. You can see the you in the background still has a little feathers there on the back. She hasn't shed out completely, but this bucket, that's the, the fiber that I've collected from that you that day. Wow. So some of the ewes will drop their fiber out in the field and we'll get a little clump or they'll, they rub it up against the fences. Others um, are comfortable. We can actually pull it out by the handful when it gets ready to shed. Now, will this fiber, even if you're picking it up out of the field, it's relatively clean, right? Because such a low lanolin content, it's not picking up a lot of dirt? Relatively clean. It depends. Yeah. Uh, some sheep, if they shed in the barn, it might have straw and hay in it, but most mm -hmm. of it is, is relative. Well, it's all relative. Right. All of our fiber artists tell me they clean it when they get it, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's relative. Now, this, with our involvement with uh, Shave em to Save Them, initially I was just mixing all of the fiber from everything that shed and selling as mixed lots. But I've heard from one or two of the fiber artists, they wanted to know more about the individuals that generated the fibers. So we now offer custom lots that are fiber from an individual U. And then I send a little biographical sketch with a picture of the U and her history and where she is in terms of lambing or, or the ram for that matter. And that's been a real hit. In fact, um, I think the majority of fiber artists now want those custom lots and it's been it's been a kind of fun expansion on that. That's great. We have a bunch of ladies. Yes, it's one of our U, U mobs. And you can see <laughs> there, uh, if you look, you can see, I don't know if, if uh, Brittany might be able to blow it up just a little bit. You can see a little bit of the variation that U on the right-hand side is a little more woolly. The mm -hmm. second, third one back, you'll see a little difference. Well, we got a we, we got a blow up of you, Brittany. <laughs> oh 
right one. I did not mean to do that. Okay. And you can see a little difference, some of the more reddish hues in there. You see the dark face, darker face there, mm -hmm. sort of a dusky face. So yeah. there's still some variability, but they, they have to have the eye stripe, distinguishable eye stripes. They have to have the black um, belly and, and back of the legs. And so those are some of the breed characteristics. Mm -hmm. They're just beautiful. I think we have this great uh, photo of you. Yeah, here I am. Uh, I too enjoy the, the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> and the sheep seem to enjoy us. So you can see that they're huddling around. I don't even think I have crackers in this case. <laughs> <laughs> but they're hopeful. <laughs> we have some that just really like the attention. So we, we enjoy interacting with them. That's Okay, and this one. is another two of the rams. Um, these are two rams we got from, I think from, uh, well, I don't actually remember, maybe from Elaine Haas in Missouri, but they were, uh, shows you that striking uh, rough and mane that they have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think we've got one more. Oh, Aww. good mothers and, and most commonly twins. So there's one of our our use with her twin lambs. Those were great photos. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, for giving us such a fabulous thorough overview of the Barbados black belly, their wonderful qualities and uses, their history, and so many great photos and videos. <laughs> I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the work that uh, Livestock Conservancy is doing and these Woolly Wednesdays, we shave them to save them, have really been nice. I've enjoyed watching others talk about what they do and their breed and, and the heritage. So uh, I really commend Livestock Conservancy. I can't wait for the next program you come up with. <laughs> Us too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Will. You're welcome. All the best. Your website, Thanks. please visit. <laughs> Everybody get in contact with you so they can find out more about these wonderful sheep. Yeah, thank you. And as I said, we we love to have visitors. We're still at the moment kind of masked up, but uh, we like to show off the breed and to help people get started. So, um, and we welcome the fiber artists if they want to come and see the animals in the flesh, and they can even help us pick up the, the fiber if they'd like. <laughs> That's a good deal. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate you. Feel free to, to join the, the Shave and Save program at rarewool.org or become a member of the Livestock Conservancy at livestockconservancy.org. Send us a note here at the Springwood Farm and we'll be happy to respond and give you what we can share. That's wonderful. Thanks again. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.